Russell Canada last year. He, he, he 
Okay, so if I was going to try to issue you a license to serve, I might suggest that those could be some rules that we follow. And I'll boil it down. Uh, to, to help people, right? Do good, succeed, be honest and frank, think big, fight for a few underdogs, build, give the world the best you have, and finally love them. So, some guidelines or rules to follow if you want to have a license to serve. Now, I've heard these before too. Usually, you hear them at the end of a session, and they're words to think about as you go away. And, and as you reflect on what leadership is and how you fit into that, that world, these are, are good commandments or things to follow. And, and this is not the end of my, my talk. Uh, this is the beginning. And I, I wanted to share this at the beginning because I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into these commandments or these, uh, uh, these rules. And they were written by a guy named Dr. Kent Keith. And I did a little bit of research on Dr. Keith. And the first thing that I think you ought to know about the Ten Paradoxical Commandments are that Dr. Keith was not a doctor when he wrote those. In fact, he was 19 years old when he wrote the Paradoxical Commandments of Leadership. 19 may seem old to some of you, but I assure you that, that is not the case any longer to me. If I could be 19 again. And so at 19 years old, which is probably pretty close in age to most of you, Dr. Kent wrote the Ten Paradoxical Rules. That's the first point I want to make. This wasn't written by some wise guru, someone that was about your age. He's a sophomore in college when he wrote those. Now, the other important thing to note is that he wrote this in 1968. Now, if you have four rows of knots over your left pocket, you probably remember 1968. If you, yeah, that, that hit home for a couple of you, didn't it? I'm sorry if I, if I made a journey to your but for those of you who were not around in 1968, let me give you a little bit of perspective about what was going on there. 1963, our nation's president, John F. Kennedy, assassinated. Kicked off a little bit of turmoil in our country, fed by a war in Vietnam. In April of 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated. June of 1968, that same year, when the 12 or 10 rules of paradoxical leadership were written, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. Woodstock happened just a little bit later than that, 1969. In 1970, students were protesting at Kent State University, and the National Guard there shot several students and protesters. So people my age and, and your age probably think of the 60s as this time with a lot of love and peace, right? Like, oh, everybody is just love and peace, but really, I think the 60s were a pretty turbulent time in our country, marked by a lot of unrest by students. So Dr. Keating, the 19 years old, college sophomore, in the midst of all this turmoil, when college students across the country are protesting actively, they're seizing the president's office, they're seizing the dean's office, they're demanding that we withdraw from Vietnam. There's someone that speaks out on his campus and says, look, there might be a different way to do things. Let's think about things like caring. Let's think about things like helping others. Let's think about what I think is perhaps the most important uh, commandment there is to love people anyway. So a, a great time of turmoil. You've got a 19-year-old that stands up and says, there's a different way to do this. Now, the 10 paradoxical commandments of leadership are actually part of a booklet that Dr. Keith wrote. And it was a booklet that he wrote to help train student councils on a different approach to leadership and service of their peers. It's actually part of the second chapter of that pamphlet. It's easily available online. And I think that there are some other things that he points out in that chapter that are worth noting here, especially in the context of getting a license to serve. So I'm going to read this. And typically, I, I refrain from reading something so long, but I hope you'll bear with me here. So these are Dr. Keith's words, uh, immediately preceding the 10 Paradoxical Commandments of Leadership. And starts, I'm making a pretty big assumption. I assume that you care. I mean, really. Not just because it's fashionable to appear concerned for those who are less fortunate. Not because you know that pretending to care is going to earn you the title of Mr. Nice or Mr. Arrowman. I'm paraphrasing that. Right there. Not because the red hat in the next row loves charitable people. Not because it's a good way to get attention in the public spotlight. No. Something deep something sincere and real, being interested in what others think, how they feel, what's important to them, what they need, 
being sensitive to the people around you and when they need something, wanting to help them. You might call it brotherly love, a concern for all. And I think as I reflect on the paradoxical commandments leadership and I started to do a little bit more uh, research into Dr. Keith, that concept of love is what pops out the most to me. It's the first paradoxical commandment, again, and I think that's on purpose. It starts by saying, people are illogical, unreasonable, and self-centered, but love them anyway. And then he closes that paragraph referring to brotherly love. And he goes on to say that unless you really care for the people that you lead or the people that you serve, unless you really love them, you'll never be able to do anything meaningful. So I want to spend the rest of my time talking about love which is not a particularly comfortable topic for a group of men, particularly young men, to talk about. Our society tells us that if you are a man and you want to openly talk about love, that you're a sissy. And I'm going to tell you, that's bullshit. I asked him, there you go, thank you. I probably should have refrained a little bit. What's, I guess most airmen are 13 and older, and if you see a PG-13 movie, they can say that one time before moving to R. So please allow me that one time. But I want to tell you that love is a powerful thing. It does not make you vulnerable. It makes you stronger as a leader. And I'm not, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about the kind of love uh, that you might feel uh, when you're in love with someone in a relationship, an amorous kind of love. I'm talking about brotherly love. And I'll put in a couple of different terms here. Um, this is the kind of love that we're called to have for our neighbor. This is the kind of love that's referred to often as agape love. This is the kind of love that's referred to in 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13, which you probably have heard at every wedding you've been to. And it ends up with uh, saying, the, the, now abide by faith, hope, and love, and of these three, the greatest is love. And the passage in the, in the Bible, one, is not only found in the Bible, it's also found in the Torah, it's found in Buddhist uh, uh, writings, it's found in the Quran. So it's not a, a Christian Thing. It's a universal thing. Love for others is an important part of who we're called to be. And so I want to talk about that kind of love. The kind of love that hopefully you have for those you serve and how important that is. And I want to start by asking you a question. If you love somebody, stand up. And if you're already standing up and you love somebody, please stand up. Right. Anybody. And I hope that everybody finds themselves standing right now. If you love somebody, stand up. Now, if you love somebody that is not your spouse or your parents or your sibling, someone that's not your immediate family, if you love someone that's not your immediate family, stay standing. And if you don't, you may sit down, and that's fine. Now, if you love someone that is uh, uh, maybe a coworker or a fellow student or someone that you go to school with, if you love someone there, uh, keep standing. If not, take a seat. That's, this is probably, I'll tell you where, where I'm starting to get a little uncomfortable. How many of you love one of your neighbors? Like one of your literal neighbors? Someone that lives on your street and on your block? Right? This is where I would say, I don't know my neighbors. So I, I would sit down. How many of you could look around a, a stranger and say, I love that person, regardless of anything I know of? And that's the really, that's the yep. and, and then I would be seated right now too. I would sit down, except for then you wouldn't be able to see me behind this podium. And so those that are standing have a special kind of love, and that's the kind of love I want to push you to think about today. And if you're still standing and you'd like to be seated, please do. That's the kind of love that's unconditional. And it's not, it's not formed around whether you know the person or how well you know the person or whether you're in love with that person romantically. It's the kind of love that uh, we are called to be as leaders. I want to push you today to think a little bit about that kind of love. Leadership is about love. I think Dr. Kent said that, uh, and that's the point I take from the Paradoxical Commandments. And I think that if you're going to have a license to serve, you need to start thinking about that license to love and giving yourself permission to talk about love and to think about love in those terms. I'm going to say that Dr. Keith and I aren't the only ones that believe in this. I'll give you a couple of other famous uh, leaders that, uh, that have talked about love. The first is Mahatma Gandhi. He says, he said, that love is the strongest force in the world, the strongest force the world possesses. 
possess the humblest imaginable. Love is the strongest force that this world possesses. Mother Teresa, if we pray, we will believe. If we believe, we will love. I think the most important part is if we love, we will serve. Service and love, interchangeable according to Mother Teresa. Nelson Mandela, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin, his background, orientation, or religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, then they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. Mandela says we are naturally loved. And if you think about an infant, the kind of love that a parent has for that infant, that kind of love and affection that infant needs and has for a parent, that is born in us. We need that out as we get older. We are taught that that is not something we can talk about. And I'm telling you, that's something that we need to keep in focus on every day in the leadership that we do and the service that we do in the ordeal. And finally, Weird Al Yankovic, who I referenced earlier, talks about love. He says, baby, I love Rocky Road, so weren't you going to buy half a gallon, baby? I love Rocky Road, so have another triple scoop with me. Which actually has nothing to do with anything I was talking about, but since I referenced it earlier, I thought, you know, I would reference something to see if you're still paying attention or we would wrestle like pigs. So, thank you. Ian or Goodman? You've all heard of Ian or Goodman. Has, did anybody know Ian or Goodman? I really hope not, because I'm going to say some things that I'm going to tell you are true, but they may not be. And since none of you have ever known Ian or Goodman, you'll just take me at my word. Ian or Goodman? Founder of our order with Carol Edson, and you probably all heard the story back in Treasure Island. A hundred years ago, next year. And when you think about Ian Goodman, imagine you've probably seen a picture of Goodman, and the picture is this old man with big, thick glasses and a, and a sash that's way too big for him. And I tell you, when Ian Goodman found the order of the air, he was 24 years old. He was born in 1891, Order of the Air was 1915, 24 years old when he founded the Order of the Air. And some of you may be thinking, oh, that's old. And I'm going to tell you that is not the case at all. 24 is not old. He was your age, or slightly older, when he founded our Order. He kept your age or slightly older. And the Order of the Air has rules as well. So and when you're thinking about that license to serve and what you would need to know and do to get that license, I think you've got to keep in mind what year did we put out to us so long ago? And there's a, there's a, 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 something that we've all recited. I, I had to hear by promise on my honors as Scott. I will honor, faith, uh, faithfully honor. You know what I'm talking about. I am not, by the way, the first person to have messed up that in front of a large audience. Uh, but I think that one of the most important things that uh, Goodman, Edson, and the others focused on, you've also heard. And while you stand up at chapter meetings or lodge meetings and conclaves and you recite that long thing, I want you to focus now on probably the most succinct thing that you've been taught in Scouts. That is something that you received likely on a dark, smoky night somewhere at your camp. There were probably a bunch of teenagers dressed up like Indians there. And they whispered something to you. They whispered you our admonition. That admonition is, and I'm not going to say the admonition because I, I want to respect that, but it means to love one another. And you know that. The greatest directive for leadership and service and scouting was whispered to you that night. And we don't often talk about that either. And I want to make sure that we understand that the very foundation of our word there is based on love. Love for others. Neighborly love, brotherly love, unconditional love. So as we're starting to wrap up, I, I want to go through a little bit of exercise with you. I want you to stand up again, and I want you to find somebody that you do not know. Take, take two minutes and find someone that you do not know. And I guarantee you there's somebody you do not know. I want you to find that person. I want you to put out your left hand. Because this is kind of, I want you to shake your hand and introduce yourself.
And the why part is the important part. Don't just say, oh, I love my mom because she's my mom. Why? Focus on the why. And the first time you ask yourself why, stop and ask why again. I love my mom. Why? Because she's my, she's my mom. Well, why do I love her because she's my mom? Because she took the time to teach me to be a man. And she taught me values. That's why I love my mom. And I want you to tell that person you know, someone that you love, and why you love them. And, uh, and, I, and I didn't 
I wasn't comfortable enough participating in that group, even though I was invited to, but I observed. And I heard uh, those guys go and talk about how much they love their brothers. And they weren't all from the same lodge. They weren't all from the same troop. They didn't care who the others were, whether they were straight or gay. They didn't care whether they were national chiefs, and one of them was, whether they were region chiefs, and several of them were section chiefs, uh, or lodge chiefs, or if they were just airmen, because that didn't matter. What mattered is that they served those that they loved, and they loved those that they served. And to share that was a powerful moment. And that had such a profound impact on me and how I pursued my life, how I pursued my career. And so i got to tell you, if you take the time to start to really think about, is there someone here that you love? Maybe don't say it to them. Maybe you're not comfortable with that, but how do you show it to them? And you can show that by serving. You can serve them and you can serve others. You can lead. You can get that license to serve. Now, I ask you to tell someone that you love them, and I'm not going to leave without demonstrating to you that opportunity. So uh, first I want to start, I love Steve Miller. Steve is a hero of mine. He's from my home lodge. Steve has been a part of my life for probably the last 15 years. Steve was a neighbor of mine before I moved to Indiana. And Steve is one of the kindest, uh, most loyal, cheerful servants that I know. Frank Federer, I love you. Frank, in a lot of ways, carries on the legacy of Artie Duncan and the, and the kindness of his heart and the way that he unselfishly serves you all. Uh, I love Ad, uh, Adam. I know he's here with the big, giant beard. And, and, and Adam was one of the people in that group that I talked to you about, about that book. Man, Adam and his friends, his brothers, exemplify love. Uh, Luke Wolf is here. I love you, Luke. Uh, I think, is, did Chris make it? Chris is the other person I know that stood on a stage in front of thousands of people and messed up the order of the arrow, uh, the slow or whatever that is. Chris, I love you. And I, and, and I didn't forget, it was the Jamboree in 1997. I love Chris. And I love that he showed up today to be with his brothers, and I'm privileged to just to be in the presence of Chris. And I love all of you. And I don't know most of you. Thank you. I don't know most of you, but I can tell you I love you. And here's why. Because you're doing something. You know, you, you hear the news and you read the newspaper, and I work with kids at the Y, and there are a lot of things going on out there that are not good things, but you are doing something about it. You have chosen to be here this weekend. You have chosen to be a part of the Order of the Arrow, a movement that means something, a movement that's based on love, and I love you for that. And I want you to know that you've earned that license to serve, and I hope that as you uh, join together in fellowship this afternoon, that uh, you serve each other. I hope that as you leave tomorrow, that you find new ways to serve those that you lead, and that in serving them, you love them. And I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, thanks for letting me be with you. I'm happy to, to, to say hello to anybody that wants to say, but most importantly, thank you for being such a part of a movement that's just getting started in 100 years. And you guys get to be a part of making it something special for the next 100 years. So thanks for that, everybody. Have a great rest of your time.